Entonces, el teorema de several things on our agenda. There's four specifically that were brought to my attention and added to the agenda by Deb. So, Chair Devin, if you would like to read the discussion. They're on the agenda page. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So, I guess for the first point on the agenda policy conversation with, um, around children age of 6 through 12 with problematic sexual behaviors and who treats them. And, and I guess just for context, um, this is coming, uh, this discussion I think is, is coming up with folks in the field um, due to um, this group of, of, of clients and youth who are you know, have been underserved, I think, in the past, kind of ones that fly under the radar, that especially those who work with adolescents it's oftentimes get um, later on when they're 16 or 17, and then you look at their, their past history and you see all these instances or CPS records, DHS records around problematic behaviors that happened when they were early, you know, early on. And maybe didn't arise to the level of, of, of abuse, but were problematic red flag behaviors. So, those who work with us know this, um, but I think uh, DHS currently is starting due to legislation that has been passed or is wanting to be passed around uh, definitions, uh, both related to who can be on CPS reports and also just identifying the fact that these younger kids are have been called into the hotline and DHS CPS doesn't really know what to do with that. Um, <clears throat> so they're starting kind of a year long uh, to kind of break out with different people in the field, you know, from from law enforcement to providers to CACs to DHS to all the people that, that work with youth like this. So it's brought up um, kind of under the SOTV's purview. Um, what about those youth uh, who are, are exhibiting those behaviors and do those do providers who are treating those folks need to be SOTV certified? Um, and statute wise, it seems like that that's gray at best of, of you know who should be treating them. Should it be an SOTV certified person or otherwise? Because there's other folks in the field that aren't SOTV that are asking and starting to see these youth and are saying, hey, our group CACs, we should see the PSB youth or other. Excuse me, what's the CAC? Child Advocacy Center. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think not only for SOTV providers, but I think that the larger community, there is questions about who should be, who are the people that are best suited to, to see youth like this. And we're talking some complicated pieces of context here that, you know, I think we would all say that a five or six year old, that we're saying six to 12, a six year old, who is exhibiting sexualized behaviors or reactive sexual behaviors can look very different than a 12 year old even who, so even within that range of what we're calling problematic sexual behavior, PSB, um, you know, there's there's a swath of types of, of youth and behaviors and, and probably ways to treat them. So for the, I guess for the purpose of this conversation, this is the conversation of, SOTV's role in, in treating these youth. Last piece I'll say is just that because the statute seems gray, it's unclear, you know, for us, uh, SOTV provider, 
what is their role if they see someone who's out in the community who's working with a 10 year old who's exhibiting these behaviors and it's been unclear whether that person should see that that youth and if they don't have SOTB certification what's our role you know depending on because this is gray um, do they go to that person and say you should you, you're out of your scope of practice per the SOTB which you kind of can't do right now so there feels like there needs to be some clarity it's my understanding that there's Uh, Kelly Crane. So I think there's some gray, but I think there's some very clear black and white too in that statute. When you look at the definition of sexual abuse, and it talks about using manipulation, force, coercion against someone who didn't give consent or can't give consent, right? Um, so some of that's very clear and not gray. And so in those cases, I think absolutely as a member of the SMTB board or as a certified sex offense treatment provider, uh, it's you know, if, if, as an LCSW, if you see someone else um, in the field practicing um, in a concerning manner, you first go to them and talk to them about it, right? And inform them maybe they're not aware of this information. And then if that, they continue, then you'd make a report. Um, and I think that's different for different words. So I think that for those those um, areas that are not gray, absolutely, I feel like there's that um, responsibility. Yeah, Scott Elmore, I agree with you 100% on that. I I get the sense, however, and then talking to Devin as well, they think they're practicing within their scope. That your sense as well. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. multiple, this is Devin, there's multiple groups that are saying we, yeah, we're within our scope. Yeah. Um, we were trained on this, we should be able to, to see these. But then they're supposed to be per this statute certified through SOTB board. So they are they may be within the scope of their licensure, but they're not within statutory uh, compliance with the certification necessary to do that work. Right, it's a lens issue. I mean, we're seeing this problematic sexual behavior and they're viewing it as maybe reactive. And for example, you know, the, the child advocacy centers, you know, their overarching big national board, the children, the National Children's Alliance, has kind of taken up um, kind of nominated uh, not a great way to say it, but like nominated themselves to be kind of the focal point of all CACs that do this work being kind of trained and they've taken on some of these newer modalities like the trauma focused PSP out of Oklahoma as if if they're trained in that modality, that gives them that they're within their school or some other modalities rather than boards to be in, be accountable to. So as we look at the next year, with, especially with this DHS big, large, you know, work group is convening, that's the pro part of the problem is that there's going to be multiple groups that are saying, hey, we we should be able to see these um, youth. Um, and then those of us who might be part of that have to say, like you're saying, Kelly, um, well, under staff view, that seems gray, though some of it does, you're right, does seem very black and white. You can't without an SOTB cert certificate. But Elmore, it, it seems like the path forward there is educating stakeholders. DHS, DHS, and otherwise, that seems like a, uh, an education campaign. Although my counter argument, my, my own counter argument, my argument is the redefinition then on the part of the people in the community. They're going to constantly be redefining what they're doing. But our education on what is an SOTB clinician, what is what their role is. So well, this is John Thomas. I I go back that you know the because we we operated you know in in our practice you know if we're we had, we participated trainings, continuing education to learn and develop best practice, and and so that's what we come back to is that education piece of 
you know, if you're going to provide treatment for youth exhibiting problematic sexual behaviors, then you need to understand the best practices over here. And part of that best practice is gaining an SOTB um, certification. Went through that. It, it, they said that's where that's my that's where my mind is going this time. Crane, um, so maybe this is an analogy a little bit. Uh, I am just getting a kid out who's been seeing another therapist waiting for his court play. And the family was told by the therapist that they can do SOTB. They can do sex with specific treatment, and they've been providing that treatment for several months to this youth. It ends up they were licensed in another state, certified in another state to do that several years ago, and they feel like that qualified them here. So even though it might be within their scope, it's not okay, right? So even though it may be within their scope because they took the trauma focus CBT, which we don't know what that really looks like, <laughs> um, it does that follow the juvenile standards, right? That we have to follow, um, then, then it's not, it's not okay. Bond, and also I just would point us to, you know, ATSA has created two versions now of children with sexual behavior problems standards of their own. The last was updated in 2023. And on that, um, you know, that panel that created those standards is some of the creators of the Oklahoma Trauma Focus PSB group. And I feel like they're, <clears throat> You know what they've written is pretty comprehensive as far as um, who they're saying should be treating these youth, and they and they're broad, <clears throat> much more broad than like a teenager who's been adjudicated or an adult. That's very clear what type of therapist needs to see those types of clients, but they're more broad and understanding that there's a, a variety of like stakeholders and people that could um, meet with these younger kids because a lot of times. Um, there's a lot more cooking within them that needs to be, you know, in trauma. I mean, this is true for all of the people we work with, but especially with kids and developmentally, and there's a lot there. So they open they open the, the gates. It seems like for different a variety of a variety of providers to see these youth, but still they need to be trained, and and that's the whole purpose of this board is that people making sure people are trained in following best practice. The question is around like, what is best practice, especially for those PSP at this point? So oh, this is great. So I wonder if as a board, we have the adult um, treatment practices, we have the juvenile treatment practices, maybe we need to develop the problematic child sexual behavior best practices. And then, and then if someone fits that, they get their certification. Maybe that's one way we do that so that we can differentiate those kinds of differences. And I mean, I'm thinking just like one of them, first and foremost, be a very in-depth assessment. Are we looking at just sexually reactive behaviors, which is very different than sexually offending behaviors, right? But sometimes you can't tell that unless you have a very comprehensive assessment. So that could be something that goes into that, that child, the problematic sexual behaviors, best um, or guidelines for practicing is you do that first, and then based on that, do you need to be certified? And here's the course of what treatment would look like. I like that a lot. And then my guess is that that would mean a focus group, right? Well, this is Bob. And from my understanding, is we have we have something that's not very clear, and until that's cleared up. There's, I don't know. So we're in the, on the regulatory piece. I don't know if there's anything we can do. I don't know if there's anything the board should do. Um, I mean, there's the FAQ that can be done, but at the same point, at the same time, I think it says that um, if there isn't someone being forced, coerced, or what, um, whatever the language was to make it black and white. That's one thing, but then this other reactive behavior or joking around or whatever. Not that it's a joke, but um, it, that's that's what's great. And if somebody has a license that says that allows them to practice with people with different behaviors, uh, I don't know where the I don't know what good a focus group would do now until the statute's changed. This is great. So. 
it, uh, that kind of focus group would be the best practices for working with the not gray, the black and white, the children under the age of 12 who are not getting adjudicated, who are using coercion manipulation, because that group also is being seen by general practitioners. And if that was clear, I mean, I think we've got two different things going on here. We have the very black and white that we just, from my understanding is very clear in statute for that definition. Right. And then we have that gray area that maybe does need to have a little bit more things happening and seeing what DHS comes up with or whatnot, or could be even covered in the best practices for that very black and white group. This is Bowen, I think, and I think you're right, and Bob, I think you're right too. I think my fear would be that in the next year, because this DHS group is happening, and these conversations are happening in live time right now, is that um, as at the end of it, you know, DHS is going to be making recommendations from where they sit on who should be seeing these youth and what is best practice and how we can handle it. Mm -hmm. So in that in that way. This board obviously isn't the place to enact that change necessarily. I think it needs to be. I guess my thinking is that this really probably needs to go back to you know OSO and, and OASA, and maybe there's a subgroup put together where it's really thinking um, quickly and, and kind of getting to what's our kind of response, knowing all the there's a lot of nuance here, and, and at the same time, um, wanting. There's an epidemic. I mean, there's an epidemic of these PSP, and we don't have enough people to serve them. And we don't want to limit like providers. It's like, like a balance, of not limiting providers could help, um, but also not just opening it so wide that anybody that does a weekend course on a modality, you know, by Monday morning can start seeing these youth. Uh, so I think that my thought would just be: I wonder if the best route would be to create a subgroup, um, and maybe with Shannon some help from the different. You know, stakeholders that are on this board, um, representatives that can kind of maybe put together what we think is Oregon's response to, you know, who should be seeing that. Because I think it's going to, whether or not we cut, we do that, it's going to come up in these meetings with DHS. And there's going to be, um, there's going to be a, a need for a response from the OSOTANs and the, the folks like us anyway. It feels like we probably need to get to that pretty quickly. And then from there, I think maybe what's decided or talked about, that can be part of kind of future discussions. Well, well, I think that you're right. Um, my opinion would be that the focus groups would be with the professional organizations, not so much this board where it's compartmentalized, right? I, I'm sorry. And, and while it's great that you work outside within your association, just be aware of quorum. Right, it's half plus one, and it's not necessarily the subject matter; right. it's the bodies. So you don't want to have been burned. Right. Oh, I know. I thought it was a spot. Sorry. Um, DHS may solve the thing. Right. So I, I'm not one. I'm not a proponent for wait. Let's see what happens. But at the same time, this might be that case. Um, where it sounds like you're monitoring it. Um, if it looks like DHS is going to the parameters around it, then um, maybe problem solved with with their statutes, and um, then maybe you know it'll trickle to your statutes that may fix it, or one of the um, associations bring it to forward, saying, "Hey, you know, to the legislature, informing them that DHS has changed it, therefore it affects us, and this is, we think this statute needs to be changed." Okay. In the legislative process is developed in a little bit of a that's my yeah that's my question so if if dhs makes legislation because of this work group is that kind of what can happen then? and it informs other statutes that kind of might be more gray or in conflict and clear it all through an association i mean you're obviously going to know yeah. what they're working on and work and talk to them say are you working on a concept and if so how does that dovetail with us because we want to make sure that we're keeping pace with change. Yeah. And that that's happened with our boards before where they make a change. Someone gets left behind and that would be a great time for an easy opportunity for an association to say, listen, we have to bootstrap some of our stuff in with this, what's about to change and moving this together serves Oregon best. 
and then I mean if they're already breaking the ice for you, get on board. This is great. Um and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of what DYTHS is doing is trying to decide who they are mandated to um, intervene with. And it's a question on how sexual abuse is defined and whether or not they're doing third party, like it, you know, um, is that not correct? My, my understanding is that there's two parts. The first part came, it came, both parts came from the first thing you just said, where it was, they're going to change definitions about who can be like an identified person on the CPS report mm -hmm. under 18. They don't want to do that. Right. And out of that came kind of an overwhelming response, not only to like that change potentially, but then just the acknowledgement of like, if you take away those under 18 kids from being on a CPS report, that further puts those kids underground because that was one of the ways that those PSP type kids were being highlighted and then helped. So then it became a thing of like, there was a big um, turn of, of, we have a big PSP problem that what they're talking about CPS just kind of flushed out. And so then they decided to make the work group two parts, CPS initial thing, and then, hey, we have this big PSP problem that everybody, you know, no one knows who's supposed to do it or who's supposed to be best practice. And there's a lot of different cooks in the kitchen. So those are the two. So it's now become a PSP thing, this model. Right, I, I believe that, um... One of the reactions they had was being very clear to mandated reporters that when you report, make sure you say if there's been coercion or manipulation or force, because that will require them to go out and assess. Mm -hmm. Without that information, they're not. They're closing at screening. So they're already using that definition. Which leaks out the gray area. <laughs> Um, Michelle Pfeiffer, I think, is the, I don't know her exact name, she's kind of liaison to the legislation. Okay, anything else with this person? Right. So I guess we move to the second um, point, which is specific training and continuing education for client populations. So my understanding is this is a, by some reason, a kind of a, a little bit of a holdover from previous board where we're talking about splitting up um, adult providers, adolescent providers, and kind of what is needed. Is it who is needed for um, like the like board, what they require as far as continuing ed and things like that, kind of making it more of like a track based system so that someone who doesn't have any training or experience with adults, if they're an adolescent provider, would need some potentially some additional training to be able to see adults. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. This is crazy. So this has been on our agenda for years, right? You guys, <laughs> um, and COVID was partly. Um, uh, a, a deterrent in it. And the idea was to do different tracks. Like you could certify to be an adult provider, certified to be an adolescent provider, then you could have a dual certification. But it's my understanding through um, what are what we are allowed to do and what we're not um, that by rules we can require some trainings in those areas. But unless there's a legislative change, we can't make different tracks. Um, and so there is the question on one whether there any groups would want to pursue and look at making any legislative changes around that. And two, um, uh, what would be those different kinds of trainings? And we had tried to put together some, at one point it was asked that the OASA group and the OSOTAN group have little subcommittees to come up with some ideas of what those differences would be. And that never got off the ground for, our, for either group is my understanding. I know it didn't for us, so and then I'm pretty sure it didn't for OATSA either. This is more, uh, it didn't yeah. have COVID hit. Yeah, COVID was it. So whether we want to go back to that, I guess, is the discussion. Okay. And then, Anne, could you clarify, so the rules versus staff, so what Kelly was saying around mm -hmm. that rules can be added, mm -hmm. but the statute would need to change the legislation. So what would that look like if 
there wasn't two tracks necessarily because that would take legislation, but rules around what kind of continuing ed needed to be um, pursued by people in, in, that were seeing those types of. Well, that's a great question. It's one of the things we struggle with now is the kinds of training for initial certifications and and there were other board members that said do we really want to further specialize providers or do we want to have with our limited number of providers have them be able to do everything right so there were conversations there so we never really got any kind of consensus at this direction we wanted to go i know that certifying people initially it's hard enough to get the hours that you need in formal training specific to sexual abuse, you know. Um, so what would that even look like? I mean, this is one of the reasons we're pushing for a subject matter expert because we have people sending in stuff. Yeah, it's alcohol treatment. Well, the sexual abuser has an alcohol problem. Sure. But that doesn't count. You're supposed to be treating the sexual abuse behavior, right? So it is really hard sometimes to parse out this training and say, is it even applicable? So, and that's the whole world. So the question is, is there enough training out there specific to these client populations for CEs that you could even get down into the weeds at that level? And I don't have the answer to that. So that would be up to you. If you think that there is so much training out there that is very specific to population, that instead of saying you need to have X number of CEs to maintain certification, without saying you're a specialized provider, because your statutes don't allow clients, you know, the clients, whether they're young, old, it's it's not specified. How you would say, okay, you're a generic provider, but we're then going to go and split you at the CE level. What does that look like? Is that doable? Right. I mean, you you could, but just because you can, you have to decide should. Right. Of what would that look like, and what would the goal be, and would that get to the goal? This is Vaughn. I, I think it kind of already happens this way because most of us who get our CUs go to either Osoden, which is real, it's the adolescent, or OATSA. There's some people that do both, but we all kind of already do. Our kind of specific area. Uh, but it's a different thing entirely to say that if you haven't been trained in that adolescent area, if you're an adult provider, you can't. can't you see shouldn't. Those yeah, you can't see those clients. That would have to be a different thing. So what we already get in kind of specific trainings. There always could be more training. I, but this is still more. I, I think if I'm understanding this correctly. What gets us in the door is sex offense specific training, but tenants are the same for both populations. You know, we're talking probably about the same thing boundaries, healthy relationships, impulse control, largely uh, healthy, you know, said healthy relationships. So some of these things translate, which creates our specialty, right? And so I think in either those trainings are public just need to come to come up specific to those different populations um, to then create trainings specific to those. That's like a curriculum. Well, this is great. I think one of the ideas was if you're working with adolescents, you should have some training in the, uh, um, the the brain development, right? Like that's really important. And that and and I have experienced folks who are working with adults um, use, um, you know, and, and and maybe not so many. Maybe this is specific to that particular to a few particular practitioners. But when I work with adults, um, it's been a long time ago, there is a lot more um, kind of, um, uh, for lack of a better word, confrontation, a lot more um, very rigid 
um, and with adolescents that doesn't fit their development at all. And so that was part of the concern. So if you have an adult provider who is using that model and then they're working with an adolescent, that's not that's not appropriate. And so how can how can we have some um, uh, way of you know separating those things out and being very clear? Like if you are going to work with this clientele, you can't use this technique. No, this is about um, if I may, and I'm not an expert in the field or any of the fields that we have, but to me, um, so you have to, to be in this profession to qualify for a license, you have to have another mental health license. But, um, isn't there a carve out in that other license where there is training to um, work with adolescents? Yeah, brain development and that kind of thing. Not required. But, uh, so you can have a mental health license and not get into Brain development children. or working with kids, working with adults. That's your emphasis. Like you went into an emphasis of child development, yes. But if you added, like if you went and got a licensed professional counselor, sort of the generic one, you could skip all those classes. And so, if I may, um, this is Bob again. On another track, on a regulatory track, if um, there's injury or a practice, question, practice standards question, one of the questions I would imagine, regardless of what board it was, the question would be, so if you're treating a, an adolescent, what training do you have? And you don't, have to, so for example, sure, okay, I, my emphasis in education was with adolescents, okay, that's fine. Well, I had no training at all. So what purpose, you know, you know, so then, I, even though it's a gray area, the question raises is, so why are you working with an adolescent where you have no training? I think it comes back to, oh, this is Thomas. Um, it comes back to, you know, ethics that we are following, the ethics of doing what we're doing. We're doing best practice for what we, we waited this line of work because we want to help people. You know, we want to, you know, make society safer. And so we, you know, we focus on the area that we have an affinity for, for, um, our treatment. So yes, we we hope we do tracks at AXA or on you know with NASW for um, you know brain development, adolescent brain development, you know young adult brain development. You know, if we're going to do addiction, then we do you know an addiction recovery track. It comes back to the to the individual holding the license, and the that they are following the ethics of doing the best. Doing following best practice for the serve the population they're delivering. So you know, you know, if it would be similar to, you know, someone providing um, substance abuse recovery but not holding a CADC. So it's it's it comes back to the individual, and I think we've already kind of been there. Is that if an individual is is practicing outside of their scope, then we go to them. We may, you know, if they continue to do it, then we call and then we contact the DLSW or the, L, the, the LPC or LMFT, whomever. And, you know, to there's a track for that, right. but it comes back to the ethics of the of the of the provider right. that we're doing our level best to meet the needs of our patients. So this is all so, so you're saying that if the person didn't pick up those classes in college, for example, they could pick up the training and see. Yes, and be ethically competent. I believe so. Yes, okay. just summarize from a from a yeah from a blanket statement point of view because you know we you know that we do run into providers. This is Thomas. Uh, we do run into providers that are you know they're you know they are they they are not they're not as good as they maybe they once were or maybe they just don't have you know there's 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 great there's there's degrees of competence in every field. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So. The ethics. This is Bob. The ethics you were talking about is that personal ethics, or is that ethics within licensure? Because that's what Thomas, and that's what we come back to the question of: Is there guidance on what best practice is? So, if I am, you know, providing, you know, if I'm working with, you know, youth who have problematic sexual behaviors, am I doing that because I have a passion for that field, and I'm because of that passion, I have gained the CEUs, whether going back all the way to grad school and in the years since, 
that I continue to stay up on top of what's on best practice, whether that's going to a CE thing, the single podcast by Kieran and McCarran, or you know what, who, you know whatever's going on. Am I doing my best to make sure I am the best therapist for my clients that I can be? Well, John, if, if I may, um, Suzanne, I think that, and I talked to Devin about this. I think that what some of our boards, most of them, really struggle with is board members are A plus players. Mm -hmm. so, Right, you guys are in this because you're competent. You tip of the spear, best practices. Yes. Unfortunately, in the regulatory world, rules are the floor, not the ceiling. Okay. You can always do better, but you can't do worse. Right. <laughs> I mean, and that's what people struggle with. If you want 45 CEs in specialized brain development, if you want to go and get your neurosurgery license, <laughs> no one here is going to stop you. But you can't go below this. Yeah. And we work with a continuum. There's a there's a curve on everybody, right? You have the folks that are up here volunteering their time and mentoring and writing publications on how to do things better. And then you have people that just don't want to get sued. Right? right? That's the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And unfortunately, the world that Bob and I live in are, did you violate the floor? Did you pick up a shovel and look for the basement? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's where we get a complaint. We look, did you go below what we consider minimum standards for public safety? Is this the best you could get? Maybe not. But did you break a law rule? And that's what is so hard for folks that are sitting in your seats to kind of square with because they want to do, you know, improve the profession, do all of those things, offer better services because it's better for everyone, right? Right. But unfortunately, we have a slightly different lens that we're working with, if that makes sense. So, uh, Tom, I just to add to what and Thomas um, is, we all know people in our communities that, you know, when you hear, oh, you know, Susie C, you know, Bob for therapy, it's like, maybe not. I mean, he, he you know, another, branch of the what you guys do here at the HLO, you know, you know, tattoos is we all know those tattoo parlors in our town that you don't go to, even though they hold a license. Exactly. And if you feel as an individual, not a board member, because we can't go out and hunt and put on our camo and go look, but as a provider, if you feel that somebody is Violating laws or rules as you understand them. I mean, we have we adopted the asset standards. We have the juvenile practice standards that are mostly based on asset, but they went. Um, they kind of did their own thing when it came to PPE and polygraph with you. If you look at that, you say, OK, this in my expertise is a violation of this rule. Anyone can make a complaint, fill it out, let our investigators do what they got to do. And eventually, one would hope that folks would be aware that there is a basement in this house and you don't go around that. This is Vaughn. So, I mean, knowing that, and just curious, this is a great discussion. I think I'm wondering if those best practices you're talking about already exist with the practice standards that are set. And so they speak to, I don't have memorized, but they would speak to you like what kind of training. What kind of background you need to have to provide services to adults or to children? What is your scope, scope yeah. of confidence? So that's already so. I guess I'm wondering, knowing that is, and I don't, I was on previous boards where this was brought up. Is it good enough? Do we still pursue like two tracks, as has been suggested, which would take much more legislative? It would need to go back to the different. Oh, and so, so different stakeholders to, to have those conversations of like, is this really something or are we good? Are things good as they are or maybe with even. Like an increase by these boards in. Um, making more clear and being more explicit about that if you're doing this work or if you're going to jump between the two adolescent and adult, you really do need to have the training that's backed up by the standards of SOTB already. And, and and then there's a little bit of like self policing um, amongst us that we see people that are doing that. It's a it's like we would do otherwise. And any other like any LPC for me, where I'm like, if you're doing a, a modality or working with somebody with trauma, but you don't have trauma training, and I know that to say that person, hey, you should really be having this training. Is that something Osso? This is it. Is that something that Osso could do? 
within your community, especially since you're talking about so much youth, maybe work with these CACs and and reach out to them and say, hey, here's some resources. Is that? I think that it's something that's uh, you can speak to, to that more than me, maybe, but I think it's very much something also can do. Traditionally, it hasn't done as much, but it definitely has the capacity in its bylaws and what it's created to be absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to what you're saying, Anne, and I think given that uh, child welfare is not opening up this mm -hmm. discussion, and um, I know at, we just recently had a conference and um, I've had several people from CACs come to me and saying that parent panel where we really get the problematic sexual behavior problem or these families were getting that help and then there we are adjudicated. I think that's really is, is going to be a, a door opener for some of these conversations, but what this board can do is is different, right? That that's Very not this so. board's role, right. but certainly Osoto right. and Oasa can can look at their perspective. But I don't. I'd have to review again the juvenile standards. I'm not sure that they mention anything about training. That I could be wrong about that. So I think a review of those, and then to see if we see anything there that maybe we could. I don't know if that means opening up a whole new focus group or what that would look like, but I think that would be the first step. If there's not clarity, that right? Would be. If you don't have the tools you need in the toolbox that was built, then you can best decide: do we go to Lowe's? Do we build it ourselves? Right? Yeah. right? Like right. you know, you have to kind of decide what you want to get, what's missing, how's the best way to get it. But this board is about public protection; it's not about professional protectionism which is making sure that we have enough providers, making sure those providers get compensated by insurance, making sure, you know, we can't promote the profession. Oh, this is something you really want to do. We can't be in a salesmanship role, right, when you're sitting here. But you're here because you have perspectives from other associations. And associations absolutely can uh, speak with an opinion, whereas here we have to be Switzerland. You can absolutely pick a border and fight on that border if you want as, but you have to make sure it's also, if you're a board member and they know you're passionate and everything, when you're at legislation or you're at one of these meetings, say, listen, I am, I have a seat on the SOTV board, but I am here as a member of OSO, making sure it, that kind of thing. And that way everyone knows what hat you're wearing and the lens that you have, you know, if that's useful. One of the, one of the things, and we'll back up just for a second, that um, comes to mind with some of our other programs here is when we discuss training um, or CEUs and the, and the board can say, you know, maybe CEUs and whatever. The question is, is it out there? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one thing that, you know, this is a great idea, but you know, is the tool out there available for people to get readily available? Not, and is know? it affordable? Because right. that's the second thing people right. want to know. Um, just to build on what Bob said, because I wish I would have thought of that. Um, a bill came out a few years ago, 2011. I don't know if you know about it, where certain boards were called out and mandated to take cultural competency continuing education. The boards could decide how much, but they had to have it. And strongly encouraged to take courses that were approved by the Oregon Health Authority's Office of Equity and Inclusion to make sure they hit all those buttons, checked all the boxes. Well, when this was required, the Office of Equity and Inclusion didn't even know about this. <laughs> okay. They had, when it was suggested in a previous bill, boards didn't bind it, not because they didn't think it was a great idea, because there was nothing on offer, right? Well, there was still nothing on offer, and it was mandated, and the stuff that's gotten approved can be really spendy. And the struggle that we have with our licensees saying, I have to take this. I've already taken it. There's nothing new and it's $225. And we were like, yeah, we know it's not ideal. So when you're thinking about stuff like this, also think about cost. Also think about if, if there's an association meeting or, you know, something where a training could be put on where you could educate a lot of people at a good price point, maybe put it online. Just keep all of that available because you want people to learn, but you don't want to make it worse. Right. If that's useful. Bon, that's great. I think the to use your analogy, I think it's a great analogy. I think the thing that I'm coming to like kind of surprise is like 
we just I think we're all wanting to just know what the real clear floor is for adolescents, for adults, and Check even the standards for the last. I mean, for the last point of the of the problematic sexual behaviors, what's the floor for people with that? I think that's what I. That's a good way to put it because I'm just. So I think that there's a lot of things we can do to help establish the floor, not necessarily in here, but outside of here. And then I think, um, and then coming back and, and having a conversation. Sure, if I may, um, Shannon has her hand up. Hey, thank you. Um, and this is going back a bit because I, I was waiting, but I just wanted to offer um, outside of the board, if there is work around wanting to look at OATSA and or OATSA, um, working on some of these additional training tracks and, and best practices recommendations, SATF would be happy to support with that. We are working quite heavily with CECs right now on a similar process for serving pediatric victims of sexual abuse. And so there might be some integration or collaboration that could help that process along. Very helpful. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. That's great. Thanks. And Vaughn, um, Shannon, thank you. And it's been great to have your folks be part of like Osoden and Eli, and Megan. And yeah. um, I think that connection, I don't know if it's happened previously, but it's like, that's a, a great direction for all of us to go. So we have all voices and they're, they're so great. And, you know, we, we need that. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're so happy to collaborate because it's, um, you know, none of us are trying to solve this problem alone. So, so happy to do that. Okay, spawn again. Is there anything else on, on that? Wait. This is Bob, if I may. So it sounds like um, with, the first topic with adolescents, this big training thing is with adolescents. So kind of, we're just going to kind of monitor it and then maybe gather some information and then feed it back to Ann. That's, that's, that's my sense. That's my sense. I think we outside of here have some direction. Yeah, yeah this is great. I think we've got some very good um, direction for our. Uh, organizations that we're representing on this board okay. to do that. And I do appreciate the the idea of like, is that training out there and is it affordable? Because that has been an ongoing discussion yeah. that OSOP has had. And, and we do some of that and it is tough, right? But, yeah. I mean, just getting the, the hours. I mean, there's some folks and we've talked about this who stay secondary clinical, right? Because they're never going to get enough hours with clients. Right. Um, you know, we have folks send us in packets of information and saying, well, surely there's 40 hours in this or 60 hours in this. And we have a brand new qualifications person who's like got an omnibus of education and is trying to pick through. And it's it's just really, really hard to find information that's not just qualifying, but helpful, really specific and helpful. And if, if I may, I'm not trying to soapbox or anything, um, but I also receive emails from other licensees and with concerns about expense. So I want to keep in mind and just bring it up to the surface now that, you know, we want to be careful and not limit. One of the concerns that was brought up was there's not enough in our today too. Uh, there's not enough professions, professionals in the profession, you know, and so if we start um, boxing ourselves in in certain areas, um, you know, it may reduce Unintended consequences. I think what Bob is trying to get to is we have had we have had um, other professionals that really were passionate about bringing the quality of services up, right. making sure that only qualified people were in this work. And in some cases, and I've experienced this with some of my other boards, and I have a number of them, Oregon's requirements are so much higher than even the national standard. We have this in environmental health. We have this in other professions. Or even the National Association is like, my God, how does anybody get qualified? How does anybody get a license? Right. And in that effort to make things awesome, you've sliced off 30% of your potential providers. And so the people that are there are awesome, but they're also dying of stress. Yeah. And right. and you know, and then you've got people that want to come from other states and they look at the requirements. Yeah. reciprocity good luck i mean your profession is one of them there was somebody who tried to come up from another state i'm like i'll say which one it was um and actually i had a conversation with somebody in idaho i'll put a pin in that but um they were saying oh reciprocity i'm called a sexual i'm a licensee under the sexual offender treatment board of this state reciprocity and i said well your title may be similar 
but let's look at what it took. Is your education, training, and supervised experience substantially equivalent? No, not even close. And they were like, oh, well, that's a lot harder. Yeah. So you had somebody who wanted to come here and do that, and they weren't even in the ballpark, right? To this end, I hope it'll help. Um, I got added to a knowledge share group, Idaho, Colorado, um, a few other ones that are struggling with the same thing. Availability of training, standardization of requirements, practice standards. I mean, they have the same problems and they asked if I would come and sit in on it. And I thought, well, if they're offering modalities or courses online or something that I could bring to you guys that we could make it available, maybe that would help in the CEU department. Maybe that would help the initial formal training. And I'm hoping to try to scare something out of the woods for, for our people because these other states are struggling with the same issue. And they were talking about problematic too. And they were like, what are you guys doing with this? Looking at it. Um, this sort of feedback that we're getting, and I don't remember hearing about this the last time we all met, the feedback that we're just getting right now from mm -hmm. uh, the board, I think is fantastic and super helpful because even though we elicit feedback from our our licensees, I don't know about it, but, but, so, um, the raw feedback is fantastic for us to take back to, and, to and our board. The spot, and we're looking at it from a total regulatory lens. You right. know, what, you know, selfishly, <laughs> how's it going to help us do our job, but at the same time, uh, you know, make it pliable, plausible, easier, applicable for, for the professionals as well. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Yeah, we're having conversations about costs and, and trainings all the time, but to actually hear from the board that we're still not hitting the mark uh, is very meaningful to, to my board. What mark are you talking about? Uh, I'm sorry, I said that. As what, which mark are you talking uh, Like, we're not, like, maybe our costs are still too high, or maybe our trainings aren't uh, enough for these sorts of things. These are okay. common conversations we're having, uh, and it sounds like we're still not doing it. Well, it's it's a matter of um, balancing quality, cost, availability. You know, the invisible hand, the best product to the best price will prevail, that kind of thing. And you never want to cheapen education, but it's finding that sweet spot of quality, availability, and cost. And we do that with our exams too. We had to write an exam for the residential care. We got a new license for residential care facility administrators added to our nursing home board. And just as COVID hit, we had to write an exam. And it says in the statute, must be readily available. Well, that's what do you do when you give an exam here and you're locked to the public? What do you do? So we scrambled, we put it online. Could somebody be cheating? Yeah, you got to balance accessibility with the potential that they're cheating. And, and you know, so there's always, you can, there's no one answer. And remember I told you when I, I did the training that good rules and good policies don't make anybody happy because everyone had to compromise. And I think you're starting to feel some of that push pull and, and I, I appreciate it. Well, and last thing I'd say, just was gonna go off what you were saying, just, <clears throat> I think there's been a misunderstanding, uh, misconception in our field of like the SOTB's rule. And so I think it's been helpful to have some clarifying conversations and some of these things that I think we need to take back and really empower our a lot of who are, yeah, they're the front lines folks and they're people that have real vested interest in this. And I do like the idea, I mean, just the, the thought of trying to balance, yeah, these high standards, but making the gate as wide as possible. Because I felt that too, that's the perfect way to put it. It's like, I felt like the gate needed to be there for SOTV, you know, to, to, to hold our, everything accountable for the safety of the community. They got real narrow and heavy to get into, which in the end, it's not about like profession protectionism. If there's no providers, there's no safety, you know? So there's part of it where it's like, we have to keep that in mind as we're talking about this in what ways um, can we make it accessible uh, to that new generation, especially with therapists, providers coming in that we want to have. Um, Great conversation. Yeah. Did you get as far as the clarification? Are we good to? Yeah, I think right now what I understand, and you've been very good at reaching out, you know, and any of you who get an idea for an agenda item, I'm your girl. Mm -hmm. um, we had a great conversation, and out of that, I tried to distill some of your topics. Mm -hmm. um, if something happens, 
let me know. Uh, we can add it to the agenda, kind of a house DHS doing. Um, I know that it seems like the 2025 legislative session feels like a million miles away since it just got warm. That's not true. Um, people are already floating concepts, working on uh, policy option packages, legislative concepts, because legislators can only, in the full session, they can carry more, but they only can carry so many bills, right? And so the influential legislators, and we've got all these new maybe legislators, right? We don't really know what their pet projects are going to be, what they're going to do. And there's already people knocking on the door saying, hey, we want you to carry this. We want you to, you know, and so knowing who the players are, knowing who the legislators are that feel an affinity for DHS and the work that they do um, would really benefit your association kind of get in on the ground floor. With it. So yeah. if that's useful to you, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, so going to regulating telehealth is the next agenda point. Mm -hmm. And could, could you, Ann, or someone else, I'd just summarize kind of what that agenda piece was? I mean, we had talked about it last, right. I think, our last. Not, you know, I, I feel like one of those TV dancers. And when we last met, yeah. um, we there was the idea of, you guys talked about telehealth. Providers providing services across state, state lines, especially it exploded, obviously, during COVID. And it's holding. In, in a lot of places. And a lot of states are using telehealth as a way to fill in the gaps for providers, right? That they don't have a lot of providers, but hey, I'm in Ohio providing telehealth. Uh, Bob has a little bit more experience with the regulatory arm of this. The hard part is if you've got someone in Oregon treating somebody in Arizona, you might very well have to have a, an Oregon license and a license where the client is. And another state, someone treating someone in Oregon, you'd have to look at what their requirements are, as well as maybe an Oregon requirement for certification because the client's in Oregon. And it can get very complicated uh, across state lines. And so we, we started talking about some of those complications. Um, Bob's kind of an expert on the regulatory arm across the borders. And then it was a question of, if you got to have a certification at the client's here and you got to have a certification if the client's in another state, this is something you want to get involved in. And the consensus kind of at the end, and I admit at the end of the last meeting, everybody was, their eyes were working independently because it was a very, very heavy board meeting. Um, the idea was that you were maybe interested in discussing looking at telehealth and what that would look like and, and kind of that world. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, great. So I my understanding is if you are doing mental health treatment with someone who lit who no matter where they are, you have to be like wait, you have to be licensed in the state that the client is. So if I'm seeing a client in Oregon, I can live in Wyoming and still see that client for mental health. But I don't think that we as as a TV board have um a, a an understanding of that. Does someone in Wyoming need to have an SOTE certificate in Oregon to treat someone in Oregon? And I don't think I think it's not clear. Um, well, once we spot, once we get um, an idea of what direction you want to go, um, we would turn to DOJ for some legal advice to, um, and, and it'll be brought to you to have an understanding. Would you need two licenses, one in each state, the one you're living in, plus the one you're doing treatment in, um, or vice versa? So, yeah, I mean, it, it's something we can we can certainly explore. You know, I don't know, you know, anecdotally why we wouldn't be able to do it. It's just, um, you know, there's a lot of nuances to it to decide is it is it worth doing. It? This is one. I mean, my, I guess my thoughts would be. I mean, just just to bring up some some of the very thoughts on this is that the other, you know, LPC, LCSW, LMFT boards, um, psychology, psych boards. I I believe that they're all in the same like aligned in that you have to have a license in the state, like you said, to provide the service. You could be elsewhere. You have an organized client. Where the client is. Right. So someone could be like be you know someone who's in Montana and is seeing so that allows for that. It would seem weird to me, weird isn't the right word, but weird that we would look into 
maybe saying that shouldn't be the case, or we feel as an SOTV board that they couldn't do that if their LPC allows them to. That would be like boards kind of conflicting, you know. So I don't personally, you know, have my opinions about telehealth, but you know, COVID, and we see a lot of people that are, you know, that are in Red River or that are Eastern Oregon, and it fills its purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so I would hesitate to want to, you know, further, you know, shrink some of that. Um, if we're just talking about telehealth outside of the state, I'm not sure how many people we have that do that, but also there, some of the people that maybe do that, um, fill up, you know, avoid that we have a need. Yeah, so I don't think this is a big deal. Like, right. you know, I, again, if they, if they have a mental health license, they have to be licensed in the right. state of Oregon to see someone in Oregon. So if your client goes to Hawaii or to um, Bahamas on vacation, you can't do a telehealth session with them because you're not licensed in the Bahamas, right? Um, that's pretty clear. I think, um, I don't think this is a big problem. Yeah. You know, I guess the question is whether or not they need to be certified SOTV board in addition to certified for their um, li having their licensure. And I don't know that we, you know, really need to do that because the only thing that that would be is like if somebody in Washington State is uh, got, uh, is seeing someone for sex offense specific treatment in Oregon and they're billing it all for private pay, so they're not using their mental health license, right? Um, but they're not certified at SOTB board in Oregon. Do we care? I mean, how many people are those that do that? <laughs> Probably none. Not the other thing. There's a English. Vegetable oil. Yeah, that's what I was how much I think part of the conversation the last time too has less to do with the licensing and maybe um, part of it was around um, the standards. You know, is there is there an expectation that maybe you know, hundred percent of the treatment is not telehealth, or maybe a portion of it is in person and and supporting that just because again back to the quality and and but again it goes back to how the standards and. Well, um, so just thinking if, if this were to happen, um, some barriers, not barriers, but uh, some fences around it would be, I, I would guess, could do group right. telehealth. It would have to be one on one, maybe at a certain specific time in somebody's treatment that they don't need to be in front of a provider. I, you know, I don't know, but you know, just. Just thinking, you know, again, from our through our or looking through our lens is to you know, what obstacles are there going to be? How can we count? Um, yeah, Elmark, so people do as a groups online. I mean, what regardless of um, state lines or not, uh, people, you know, because we don't have very many practitioners, people do. Uh, telehealth SO treatment all the time because you know they might be in the valley and the people are across the state or, or vice versa or down south. Uh, so uh, it's not my favorite method of treatment, although I do know plenty of practitioners who do uh, online only SO treatment from start to finish, groups and not groups, you know, because it's just filling the need, as Devin was saying. Is it just aren't a lot of practitioners and the availability and location and this sort of thing. And they found a made a, found a way to make it work in a system that otherwise it isn't working. So this is about some of the concept be more around out of state providers. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what I'm hearing from this because I think it's already happening. I mean, the telehealth aspect from start to finish treatment, I think was already occurring. So what I'm hearing uh, from this is whether they need to be licensed, uh, you know, or certified rather, out of state providers. Uh, I think that would be the question, I guess. Unless somebody has an opinion on whether people should be doing as a as a work online. Or not. Well, they're doing the swab again. If we're doing treatment in Oregon, they're going to have they're going to have Oregon's certificate tethered. Thanks. I um 
was hearing a few things and just wanted to to chime in. Um, the conversation in regards to um, like you, you there had been mentioned, not necessarily whether telehealth is allowed under the license, but whether the board wants to take a position on regulating any aspect of providing services via telehealth. If the board feels that there are certain practices that need to not happen uh, via telehealth, but would need to happen in person. That would be where the conversation, the rule writing would be is to regulate that piece or whether the board feels that just its regular rules apply in that regard. Um, it would be that type of conversation about whether rules are needed to separate out where the board feels that uh, telehealth should not happen. Bond. So I don't. I mean, I guess we can discuss, but I'm I'm not feeling the need to like regulate um, any of the pieces that Heather just spoke to. Um, I think that there's folks out there that are doing telehealth, and some people even that are just doing only telehealth. And I've heard of you know certain juvenile departments or certain people just not wanting to use that person because maybe they think an in-person provider is better, and so they're making those choices to kind of get who they want. I haven't heard of anything, you know, any out of state folks that being a big, big problem, you know, any big issues. So I guess I'm not feeling the need. Um, I don't know if you all are feeling the need to, to go further with. Well, we were just driving sober from the last meeting. So if we're we're good for that right now. Um, but, right, just to clarify, yeah. you had said that there was a problem like you're on the border. Can you explain more what that looks like? I guess my, so we have had um, providers from Washington State so we're there, right? Um, providing evaluations um, for treatment and, and there's just question about, you know, the same standards of practice. And um, and so that would be my concern for, or, you know, even as far as South Dakota, um, providers reporting to be sex offender treatment providers that don't, So, uh, I guess I would just, what it sounds like, we're, if you are, please, right now, um, if you are providing service, I think that's uh, certification. Certification. But is there anything that starts that? Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. well remember, we, you know, <laughs> if I could get in the way back machine. Um, it talks about sexual abuse specific treatment means the process of evaluation and reformation. And then it says a person may not in 675 370 engage in the practice of sexual abuse specific treatment unless they have um, certification or an exemption. From Oregon. Exactly, exactly. So and the exemptions are actually outlined um, a student enrolled in an approved educational program who's pursuing a graduate degree in a mental health field, a person employed by a local, state, or federal government agency, community, community mental health program or drug and alcohol treatment program licensed or certified in Oregon if the person's activities and services are within scope and within the person's scope of employment, or if a person's a recognized member of the clergy. Those are your exemptions. And if you go to legislation and you Add exemptions, take them out. That would be the time to do that. But this would be a person like in Washington who is not certified in Oregon. They're certified in Washington, so that would be that could be up to a board complaint because they don't have certification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily telehealth. It's a more of a licensing, yeah. a licensing issue, or you know, again, if it's parole, probation, and they're not contracting. You know, sometimes they have to contract or they want to contract with uh, certified providers. Then it would be trying to figure out who's doing what and under what authority. And then it might be a complaint. You know, I'd have to see. This is great. Just a an anecdotal thing. I have over the years several times have treated kids that were adjudicated in Idaho but live in Oregon, right? So they're being treated in the state where they live. But there's a contract with Idaho to provide that service. And they yeah. certainly want me to be certified in my state. Absolutely. But 
with my contacts with the states around the, this is something I, I used. I spoke with her for about an hour. I used my opportunity talking with Idaho and you know some other states. Don't forget we have our practice at you know some states don't. You know, they're a little further behind us that way. And they're like, oh, you mean it's a thing? Yeah, it kind of is. So <laughs> just just so that you know, I'm trying to get that information out there from my level, not in a promotional way, but an educational way. Yes, sir. <clears throat> oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I and honestly, the, I'm sorry, English. Um, dealing with it, it's been probably four or five years um, since we've had this issue. And so understanding you now. <laughs> Well, and going from a remember, it takes things time, it takes people time. That it, this was a voluntary certification in government terms, it wasn't that long ago. You know, that and take COVID out, like, because that was like a whole gap in time. Um, that it was voluntary for a long, long time. And somebody might, the, I've had people with questions based on rules that they send me that were repealed in 2012. People don't always stay current. Right, so they might be still operating under the assumption that it's a voluntary certification. It's not so education. Okay, so now to licensing requirements, including forensic evaluations. And reminder of just, I mean, what we talked about last time. We want to. Does the board want to make any? Is that right? Any recommendations based on? It's my understanding that there's a an FAQ. I mean, sometimes when there are issues that people continually get confused mm -hmm. on, uh, the office can put an FAQ together. We did this for our temporary staffing agency program where we're dealing with companies that are not in state. They don't understand our fingerprint requirements. They don't understand our ID requirements. Um, we need a social security number. We had a company in Europe. We don't use those. What do we use? You know. And instead of having our valuable staff on the phone all day long answering the same questions, we put a little thing together that says if someone's applying, send them this and it will help them. Right. So it's my understanding that if you feel like there's enough confusion in the community about forensic evaluations, um, I know that at some point there was some assertion that they needed to be certified and then there was a pushback and all. If you feel it would be useful, in the community that there's enough of an issue and enough confusion that putting an FAQ out there about there would help. Great, but if, if it's something that you feel is not that big of an issue. What do you think? This is Crane. I think this came up because there was concerns that some evaluators were making recommendations that the court was then requiring the treatment provider to follow. So it was more of a concern for that than um, necessarily who has to have one and who doesn't. And I, from my understanding, um, the statute we have now says they don't have to have it. And so if someone wants that to change, that again would be a legislative thing that a subgroup would need to look at. And I believe that if my understanding is correct, that would be based. The part you need to focus on with that would be the process. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you know, if it's A, B, and C, yeah. and here's your process, but you're only doing A and not for the purpose of the process, right? So as long as you're really strong in your understanding of that, then you know what to target in on if you want a particular outcome. Yeah, and Crane, I think that's the issue exactly. It's is the recommendations part. Of and it looks like that's not spelled out. Vaughn, do you think it would be helpful? I mean, Kelly, to to, to have an FAQ like Ann talked about, where there's there's something online where we can reference a point to that kind of gives clarity around that rule. I yeah, I think so. I don't see that it would be harmful. Around, around the forensic evaluation piece. And also around the definition of sexual abuse, all of it, you know, that okay, so come to understand. <laughs> so forensic evaluations and definition of sexual abuse. Now, before we hit the go switch, are there any unintended consequences of having this information out there that you can think of? Watch everybody's hands up there. Is there anybody that's, again, the lens that we have is who's going to get a shovel and look for the basement, right? Um, is there any 
possible unintended consequences that you could think of from having this information out there. The definition of sexual abuse and the forensic evaluations are people are doing this work were not required to have certification. I think the potentially one of the unintended consequences is already occurring, which is there's no clarification in terms of the training that people need to have. So people are doing forensic evaluations who have never actually sat or worked with sex, someone who's been uh, people who um, are sexual abusers. So they don't have any experience, and yet they're doing these evaluations. Okay. Um, remember, our mailing list consists of licensees and interested parties. That's another thing. Our website. Who would be going to our website for this information that's in that realm that you're thinking of? So, if that, that's really what the issue is, if that's the string that needs to be pulled, is that something that an association could maybe? Because I mean, HLO talking to the court systems would be very. I, I don't want to use the inappropriate word, but maybe unusual. Um, because it's it's kind of not our role. Like we would never start a turf war with another board. That's just not how we do it. So if you've got people in your in your experience that are maybe doing something that are not really ready or educated enough to do that work appropriately, is that something that an FAQ from HLO would reach that audience, or would it be something that Maybe an association would say, hey, this is going on in our community. We've learned this. We would urge you to work with these providers, and this is why. Yeah, I, I think in, in rethinking, I'm sorry, in, in rethinking this um, in, in our specific lens, it's something that our boards need to, to work on as opposed to the SIQ. So we get those back to what our right. boards need to do. And we don't have a problem doing it, but it just, it's one of those things where it's like we wouldn't send our FAQ necessarily to the core system. And and it's really funny. We have folks that have asked us in the past. Um, you need to send out a letter saying if you're not certified with this particular board, it could be the unlicensed practice of psychology. Who would I mail that to? I mean, you know, I mean, we have licensees and we have interested parties. How? I don't have a blip and I can airdrop communications over the greater metro area, you know? So I'm like, it's like a great idea and I would love to do that. How would I reach these individuals? So if you look at the target individuals, would, so would our, I mean, we're happy to put the FAQ up on the website if you want to send somebody to it. Is that something you're interested in, the definition of sexual abuse and the forensic evaluation piece? Oh, and those are in this, I mean, this information, I would assume, you know, my understanding is that the FAQ is going to be um, something that's in statutes. I mean, it's something that's already there. So if that needs to be addressed with somebody or some entity or something, that could be done by a group or a person. It doesn't, you're right. It's not the best. Okay. No, and this is what we're here to parse yeah. this out. Like, what do you want? And what's the best tool in the toolbox to get it to the intended right. audience? And that's one of the things is. You really want to target your communication. Right. You want to have it done in a language they understand. And you want it to be helpful, not threatening, you know, that kind of thing. And when our seal is on something, it's very different than when an association is like, listen, we're here to help. We're here to understand how can we be. And you you guys have different tools in your device. So yeah. if that's helpful, so great. OK, we've got that figured out. So was there anything else in the policy area. This is a great conversation, by the way. Really appreciate everybody on the phone. Thank you. I know I'm not looking at you, but thank you. Um, is there anything else in the kind of like policy area that we still needed to talk about or we could check with our public interested parties feedback? Nothing on nothing for me. Anything else that we missed? Any anybody here on the screen? Poor John stepped out John. for a moment. <clears throat> It's been a really robust conversation, though. We really appreciate it. Um, if not, um, do we have anybody on the phone, Terry, that we suspect might be a public member? We do. Okay. 
Okay. At this time, the sex, sexual offense treatment board will hear public slash interested parties feedback. Members of the public, please wait until you have been recognized. Once recognized, please state your name and affiliation to the board for the record. Devin? Mm -hmm. Another Devin. Devin, do you have public comment? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I'm Devin Palmentier. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexual offending therapist through this board. Can I just talk? <laughs> Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so my comments were um, pertaining to the conversation about the treatment of problematic sexual behavior in younger children. Um, so I appreciate that conversation. Um, so I think since hearing that conversation, um, I'm going to kind of, I guess, clarify, I think my comments are related to kids that would fall outside of that definition that board member Kelly Crane you know, clarified about, um, you know, what defines abuse um, with the coercion and aggression. Um, but my comments, I think, fall into kind of two categories. One just concerns about potential barriers um, and then just about, um, you know, what is under the purview of this board. Um, so I think it was mentioned that, you know, more regulation can be a potential barrier to people's doing this work, um, which is not something we're necessarily wanting. Um, and, you know, I think in the ATSA report, and then we heard on Monday at Osoten from Andrew Monroe that, you know, he, he said basically any child therapist who's used to working with kids, knows child development, used to working with impulsive behavior problems, should be able to do this kind of work with just some additional training. Um, and, you know, as far as regulation, I think another barrier could be cost you know the current sotv board certifications are more expensive than licensure um for some for some uh comparison it's one year uh for the sotv board certification is more than two years of my lmft license um and so you know i think that putting up more regulation around people trying to work with kids who have problematic sexual behavior um you know just the cost of ceus and cost of additional regulation could be a barrier and then um, just thinking about why 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 is that under the purview of, of this board if we're talking about kids who um, are having problematic sexual behavior that wouldn't necessarily be defined as abusive. Um, I was curious about if there's any evidence of harm um, by providers that would necessitate regulation of this by this board, because um, you know, that's one of the reasons that we have these boards. Um, I'm concerned about identifying problematic sexual behavior in youth, putting it under the category of offense-specific treatment, um, since that's what um, this board regulates, and that you know, having, having it regulated by a board that has sexual offense in its name um, could create some more stigma for those kids and could indicate to the public or to families that the kids are kind of dangerous in some way. Um, and then I was just curious about, it seems like maybe an expansion of what the board is regulating, if they're regulating, you know, offense specific treatment at this point, um, that regulating the practice of licensed clinicians to sort of declare specialization. Um, if it's kids with problematic problematic sexual behavior, um, seems like maybe beyond what has been done or beyond what maybe is under this board. And so I was curious about the process for a board expanding that authority. And is there like a precedent with other boards? Um, I think just my final comment was that, um, you know, maybe potentially like adding an endorsement to an existing SOTB certification that says, you know, you could sort of add an endorsement to your certification that's like, oh, I also have this other training with younger kids um, rather than like a separate licensure potentially. So thank you for hearing my comments. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Nobody else?
this is Kelly Craig. I have one thing. This is my last meeting being on the board, and I want to thank Bob and Ann and all the staff here. I've been on this board for almost eight years, so it's been a lot of time together, minus COVID. And I was looking back and I was thinking how what a privilege it's been for me to be on this board when we moved from being a title act to a class of that. That was really important to me to see happen, and I was glad to be able to participate in that. And then also um, in the restructuring of the juvenile standards, um, I felt very um, pleased that we were able to include in those standards that we are victim focused, which I think is really, really important, and that um, the use of polygraphs is a treatment tool um, to be used as a treatment provider find it necessary, not just we're going to do them all the time for everybody, but that we still have that uh, ability to, to work on them. And I'm super excited about the problematic sexual behaviors being um, uh, worked on here. And just want to say, although I'm going to be off the board, I might be on the phone. That's my dog. <laughs> I remember um, that was robust conversation. That was the first thing that really created heat mm -hmm. in the meeting was who are we working for? Are we working with the person in front of us? or working on behalf of the victim and that was that was probably two solid meetings and that and i remember some of their findings came back from the board and they were like yeah we like this we don't like that but yeah i remember that was that was robust so good work you guys are doing i also i guess i also really do want to say i'm really pleased with who's on this board and i'm being replaced by Brittany Rinicky. i sent a um, <coughs> Her contact information, and so she should be able to get up and running by the time in the next board. So it feels good to be with these folks all here. Yeah, it's a great new group. We really appreciate it, and hopefully, um, the application process for the board. Derek is a great uh, resource for that. Derek Foltz, and um, he'll send her all the information he needs. I know we go through work day now, which is a little can be cumbersome to get it up and running, but once you're in there. It doesn't seem to be quite so bad. So thank you for a timely recommendation. Vaughn, can I say, I just want to say thank you, Kelly. You, I mean, I think on behalf of, I can speak on OSO and on the, the greater community, um, those who hurt others and, those, and, and victims, survivors of abuse. I think you not only just in the work you do, like you, the case of the people you still see actively, and then those you're like mentoring and have under you. Um, and then, <clears throat> You know, beyond that, then spending your time volunteering on these boards where you do sometimes have to, you know, you use your voice when sometimes that's it's not popular. Can you push back? You know, sometimes it's like swimming against the current. And you've really been like a forerunner of that. Um, the voice when no one else wants to say it. Um, you know, I think here a little bit, and I think also and just in, in the community in general. So I think that encourages and challenges a lot of us to do the same, to call things when we see it, you know, to, to look towards progress, um, you know, all for the sake of making this world better, ending abuse, you know, big picture. So we don't say it enough, but we, I want to say thank you for the work you do, and it's, you're making an impact that's lasting beyond, you know, your time on the board or the boards Thanks. and your work, it's going to go forward. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Well, no. <laughs> Well, I live in the South, no one cries low. Don't do that here. Um. Uh, this is Bob. And coming when you came on the board, I was down in the regulatory side. So I do a Travis does pop in and pop back out. Um, but it's it's been refreshing, interesting to be on this side of the table as the interim director. Now, hopefully I said the interim director at the beginning of that chair. For some reason, I didn't realize the chair. Yes, yeah, anyway. once, but it's OK. Yeah. I shall be dealing with it. But you yeah. know what I was talking about. He wears a yeah. lot of hats. I mean, so, you know. But your passion yeah. and uh, has been, you know, to, to me, it's been a growth for me to see it these last two board meetings with me on the side of the aisle. So thank, thank you very much. Yeah. I, we, we are so happy, and I told Karen during her uh, orientation, we don't work without people who are willing to give up billable hours and clinician time and clients. And some of our boards, they don't make money if they're not standing behind a chair, you know, doing hair, and they give it up to come in here and try to make things safe for everybody. So we're always incredibly grateful. So thank you. 
still working with a great mentor. So, you, know, you know, all these new people. <laughs> so, Kara, um, if you're ready to yep. close this meeting, bow us out. Okay. Sexual Offense Treatment Board meeting is adjourned at 1231. Yeah. <laughs> and feel free to reach out. Um, I want to, my parting piece, because I like to tell you when we're going to be here next. Um, we, our next meeting was um, elect was for November 15th. So at that, we're going to choose to be chair and vice chair. We're going to pick the meetings for 2025. I know it's terrifying. Wow. Um, if in the meantime, do you get any ideas about um, legislative concepts or anything like that? Please, at least we can't weigh in, but there's a lot of conforming amendments that make things work, right? Let Bob know, let me know, and we can't we can't add any weight to it. But we can sit down and say, don't forget about the amendment that allows us to investigate. So we have had some bills come through and they forgot to include allowing us to issue renewals. I mean, little things like that. And there's so many of them. I think there's like 13 or 14 conforming amendments. So we can make sure that things work as they're supposed to work. And Ledge Council does a great job, but they're not us. And sometimes they leave things out, unintended consequences. So include us. So we'll sit down and we'll say, okay, this works, this doesn't, or don't forget this. Have lunch. Okay. Um, HLO staff and uh, DOJ, Heather. Um, I don't think we'll have a meeting afterwards. We're good.